Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Fret Buzz. Uh, we have some really cool stuff planned uh, for uh, tonight's episode. Um, we are going to jump into uh, Dave and I. You know, we talk about all these guitar players and stuff, and all all the different ones we want to cover. And we thought we'd jump in with uh, Mick Jones uh, from Foreigner. Um, you know, yeah, not, to confuse, not to be confused with the other Mick Jones from the Clash. From the Clash, yeah. And uh, you know, obviously, you know. Dave and I want to first jump in with Ace, but we got to let that one simmer a minute because that's going to be a long episode. Dave and I were just such huge fans as, as kids growing up. And, you know, we got to do our pull some different things together for these guitar players. So we'll we'll have Ace on another episode. But tonight's is uh, Mick Jones. And, you know, for those that don't know, uh, you know, I know a lot of people don't actually know the names of people in bands, you know, a lot anymore. But, you know, you know, five decade, uh, you know, uh, guitar player and producer, um, you know, this guy and Lou Graham were, you know, the quintessential, you know, guitar player singer combos, right? You know, you, you look at a lot of these bands from 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way to the present. It seems like, you know, a lot of times, you know, those two types of uh, uh, people in the band, the singers and the guitar players do a lot of the writing. I'm sure there's others, but it's really interesting. You know, you look at, you know, Aerosmith and all these other bands, that's kind of why those two guys are always in the band. They're always at the front of all the media. You know, they always get the covers of the magazines and all the rest of the band kind of gets stiffed, you know, but um, you know, Mick and Lou are, you know, another one of those amazing combos, um, you know, massive, massive hit songs all the way from like the mid seventies, uh, you know, all the way through the eighties and nineties, um, you know, kind of chameleon like band as they navigated the different sounds through those decades and, we're still just writing amazing, amazing hits back then. And uh, tonight we're going to cover Hot Blooded and go into some of the details of that. Um, um, but before we do, you know, we also wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the gear from that era and some of the things that Mick, um, you know, Mick used for some of these early recordings and kind of how he, you know, still uses that stuff today. He's got some tried and true gear that, you know, that he stuck with over the years, you know, versus like, a, you know, an Eddie or somebody else that was just constantly changing and chasing a different tone. Mick's kind of just one of those rock players that kind of locked in and he's got it some worked. gear that he's used over the years. So, Dave, you know, you did some research on that. What what did you find on some of these early records and some um, of the gear that he used? It was pretty, pretty light. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people, at least back then, you know, you know, there weren't as many guitar players that were geeked out on this stuff as much as most people do nowadays. Um, in some of the articles I read, he, he stated that he was using uh, Marshalls, 100 watt Marshalls. So that would probably have been a, a Plexi or a JMP, uh, something like that. Um, so he's, he said he favored the 100 watt ones. Um, he used high watt cabinets. And then um, I, I read. A couple of different conflicting things. One was it was Celestian speakers, and one was Fane speakers. Mm. Um, he had a, a a fifty-seven Les Paul custom Black Beauty that had the three pickups. He, he, yeah, he removed the middle pickup for that because he didn't like it. You know, I never understood the middle pickup thing, but you know, especially in Les Paul, I guess it was just more is better. Kind of thing. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? It's like that's exactly where your your, your pick goes. So it's like, it's, why would you want exactly. you getting that thing? But um. <laughs> Maybe you know you know bass players use those ramps too. So in that Floyd Rose guitar too had the ramp thing where it made yeah. people picked on top of that and they liked. I don't know, but um, you don't you don't hear many people you know giving the rally cry for the middle pickup. You know, right. no, no right. one's really meeting, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the, in the middle pickup. That's um, so true. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and, and that's basically it. He said uh, he said that this time he uses the same things as he you know now that he did then. Um, I know he doesn't perform much anymore. Um, he had a heart problem and then um, he had to, uh, so, so basically foreigner plays as foreigner without any original members, which is a, a whole nother conversation Yeah, that we can have about bands that are doing that. But um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, my take on that too, real quick is that, you know, if, you know, if, if it's done justice and it's, and it's, you know, sanctioned by the people that are in the band, you know, I don't see a reason why not if people still come, you know, just like you said earlier that, you know, who, you know, who knows who the drummer is for Jethro Tull, you know, yeah, nobody, nobody, you know, the singer and that's basically it. So, yeah. 
And the guy they got now sounds just like him. So it's like he does a great job. Kelly Hansen, he does. Um, he was in Hurricane, I think, the band he was in, and from and from the eighties. But um, he does a great job. And you know, um, good old Jeff Pilson's playing bass for him. Still. Yeah, playing bass for him still. Yeah, he's been there for a long time. I think yeah, like almost ten years or something. He's the MD, the musical director too for them. Yeah, so he yeah. has all the key changes and and things and stuff for him. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much it about the gear. It's it's a lot of stuff is you know in the, the studio the way it was recorded and you know the hands you know it goes back to the player yeah. and yeah um, he did some cool stuff that you know did wasn't really you know the same old same old so that that right. just stuck out to me it was like him and uh you know cheap trick you know Brick yep. Nelson and you know yep. 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 people like that that just they you know, L.A. Easton from the cars even even the cars man I mean yeah. it's like, they they played things that you could sing, you know. Yeah, yeah. I like the I like the power riffs, you know, back you know, of course we know we know the recording techniques now, but you know, as kids we didn't know that. But you know, Mick was one of those guys that double and triple, you know, stacked his guitars. Uh I've got some sound samples we'll get into here in a minute. And it's really interesting, even though, you know, back then super high gain amps, you know, weren't really a thing. You know, um, I mean obviously Van Halen you know, Eddie kind of pushed the boundaries on that quite a bit. You know, once once their debut record came out, everybody was like, holy cow, this guy's got twice as much gain as everybody else. But, yeah. you know, but, you know, Mick and those guys that were just doing that, just that heavier bluesy rock stuff, and you stack that thing two or three times, you can get some really amazing tones, uh, like, even yeah. though a single pass on that guitar is a kind of a thin sounding, um, as we'll hear here in a minute. But, boy, when you stack those things up and pan them in a mix, they sound really good together. So. Yeah. Um, pretty amazing. So when, you know, I think, you know, for me, Dave, the first time, you know, me hearing them would have been, you know, early 80s would have been my first time uh, hearing them and just being blown away by just how powerful, um, you know, like you said, you know, kicks and snares, heavy guitar riffs and melodies, you know, him and Lou writing this stuff and producing these records, just a very unique and different for them. When was the first time, you know, you remember kind of hearing them and kind of going, wait a second, this guy's um, Got a little different juice here. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. See, my again back to my dad. He was a DJ and and he was playing mostly disco things. And then, you know, we moved to over on Pegwood and um and Huber and I met a guy across the street, Tim Finfrock, and he he basically yeah, introduced yeah. me to all this stuff. Yeah. So it was yeah. it was uh my intro to rock, so to speak. Yeah. And, and you know, he was playing that stuff, cheap trick. Um just trying to the, the one those are the ones the two that really stand out. And then yeah. And then from there, you know, we went on to the Kiss thing, and then yeah, then Van Halen came along, and yep, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think it's really cool. Um, you know, you listen to these records today, and what I find really interesting is, you know, for those that don't know, you know, Dave and I have, you know, recorded stuff, you know, gosh, over the past, you know, two decades, and you know, there for a minute, you know, I was recording bands like crazy, and and a lot of people don't realize with today's technology um, it does make it a lot easier to, you know, to, to make songs with, with a band. But when you go back to that, the, the days of like ACDC, you know, foreigner um, cheap trick, um, good luck, good luck making a record sound like foreigner today. Right. Yeah. You know, there is something about what those producers brought to the conversation uh, the the gear they were using. Yeah. Like, you know, mix, it's it's everything. Yeah. Yeah. And like Dave said, you know, for, you know, for these guitar players, um, you know, Nuno did a, did an interview there on, uh, uh, you know, Rick, uh, you know, Beato's channel. And, uh, you know, he said he got a chance to play Eddie's rig once in front of Eddie and he goes, and it didn't sound like Eddie. It sounded like me. And, and that's just proof, you know, the 80% of their tone is their hands and the way that they're playing. And yep. Mick was one of those guys that just was one of those just, awesome just the guy's a riff monster where he can just come up with these riffs and and pretty incredible stuff you know considering how you know how old some of these songs are um mm -hmm. and how powerful they were back then uh you know compared to some of you know today's uh today's rock you know these these the reason people listen to this stuff still still is because it sounds killer it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a great song great you know producing and you know memorable lyrics and you know amazing it holds up. It holds up. Yeah, and it does it holds up so let me um, let me share this here a little bit, and we'll get into a little bit of uh, 
All right, Dave, can you see that all right? Yeah. All right, so here's a little bit. So I got a little session uh, set up um, uh, for those that are out there wondering what this is. Uh, Soundation.com is a is a, just a newer doll that's available. There's a free version of this. I just dropped some you know individual WAV files. Um, I've got a ton of these things laying around that I've collected over the years, and Dave shoots them my way because he knows I'm a producer geek. <laughs> so we'll listen to kind of a little bit of the mix, the full band, and I'll solo out some of the guitar stuff so you can kind of hear what we're talking about um, just from the, that raw guitar playing. You know, one of the things there, Dave, it's pretty crazy. You know, when, man, when did this song come out? 79 or something or yeah. 80? Yeah. A lot of people don't realize, you know, most people don't realize even back then how much distortion was put on the bass guitars yeah. to, to thicken up the mix. And Damn. when you listen to this, he's got a lot of distortion on this thing. Yeah. how they they dub in the yeah. jung, the jung jung part yeah you can hear the double the double chunks but you can also hear that's two not a single pass right you can hear that yeah it's it's two separate tones too it's, it's two separate tones and two separate passes and for those that aren't familiar with that you know mick recorded you know you know probably just the verse or the chorus or maybe the whole song nobody really knows how these things were recorded back then you know a lot of bands in the studio recorded it front to back live together you know, they didn't start breaking that stuff up uh, into individual parts until way later, like when Pro Tools and stuff came out. But, um, you know, you can hear the double stack, but also, too, there, there is an additional rhythm track that I'll play here. That So it's really triple stacked, uh, which was coming my, my point earlier. Mm -hmm. A little chunky there. So there you can hear... Um, not only is it double stacked, but for the guitar players out there, if you listen close, you can hear that he's not just playing the chords in the same register. So he's actually playing chords and power chords in different registers. What I'm hearing is maybe even some octave work down in there to get that full that full guitar range in the in the recording. So listen again here. So I don't know who remembers that little that little melody riff that's right inside of that in that chorus. Listen again. I'll show you love and like you never knew. That's why I'm hot. I another another really classic. Um, you know, technique uh, back then, and a lot of bands still do it. To you know, today, you know, adding that Leslie in there—that's essentially an electric guitar, right? Yeah. yeah, it's a keyboard, but when you listen to it, it's super dirty. The you same know, register, it, yeah. Yeah, it's the same range as the guitars. You got multiple octaves, right? So not only are you getting, you know, the guitar range, but you know, these those guys are laying heavy on the bass notes too. So between that and the bass guitar, you know quad stat guitars essentially because you're adding a fourth pass on that on that leslie that's a really big you know kind of secret recipe to how those bands back then were getting those thicker tones without all the crazy high gain that we have today <laughs> I 
All right, so we'll jump into this this solo here. Um, you know, we'll we'll talk about the solo afterwards, but I'm, I'm going to listen through it all the way. One thing that I want everybody to listen to is out of context. When you listen to the solo by itself, it kind of sounds really sloppy. It's just a bunch of random stuff. But hey, that's rock and roll, right? So yeah. you know, who knows? Maybe um, you know. Maybe he was out drinking the night before, and it's part, know, of, part of the charm, isn't it? That's just part of the charm. <laughs> so it's it's pretty crazy to listen to. It. So here, check it out. That's so, that is so crazy, man. Yeah, that's not the uh, that's not the end result of what's on the record. That yeah. Parts parts of it is you can hear certain parts of it, but you know, I was telling you earlier, and um, I read an article where he said that he it was all a comp, man. He played it like three or four times, and yeah, and the you know the producer went in and picked the best bits, and yeah, the last part especially is is completely different on the record. Yeah, completely different. Yeah, and great great point on you know, what the producers are doing even back then. Right. So what, what Dave means by that is typically the guitar players would just play a solo all the way through second pass. They might do the same solo or they might just, you know what, I'm going to wing it. I'm going to change my phrasing a little bit. I'm going to do whatever. And, and the producer comes back and maybe takes like two measures of this, two measures of that or whatever, and kind of copies them around. Now back then though, that was a big deal. So there's no, no doll, no digital audio workstation, no pro tools, that's tape. So when those producers were doing that back then, they're, they're what they call splicing tape. That was a huge pain back then to have to splice. Well, if, they had, you know, if they had, if they had extra tracks, you know, they would, they would use those tracks and then. Yeah, they could do that too. And then they would eventually do the splice where they would, they take a razor blade and they yeah. cut. The tape. Had a little machine that would do it, make yeah. sure it would stay square. And then they right. had to get that right on the downbeat because you can't splice that stuff in between a, you know, a one and a four or whatever, you know, so you can, you can, you can mess it up too. (laughs) You can really screw it up. So it's pretty crazy how it doesn't sound as sloppy anymore. Right. And it kind of just, it blends in with that pocket, right. Pocket is the, the groove and rhythm of the, of the rest of the band. Right. So he's right in there just hitting on those downbeats like he's supposed to, and, you know, matching up with the rest of the band. Um, Another really interesting thing there. And Dave, I want to get your opinion on this after listening to this like, you know, 20 times in prep for today's session, tonight's session, man, I can hear some ace in there. You know, there's yeah. definitely some ace influence on some of that riff, you know, and I was like, that is really interesting because not a lot of people used ace as a inspiration because ace yeah. is a really sloppy guitar player. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could have been, you know, they could have had, you know, he could have, you know, who knows what they listen to, you know, and each, each, yeah. you know, growing up and it's just like anything, it's like you're listening to the next person and, and he, you know, they were all borrowing from somebody at that point. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah. very true. And, it, and this outro chorus is pretty cool too. There's some good riffs in here. So if you listen to this section right here, you can hear just so many guitars are stacked right here. You know, what I what we have is one track. This is not one track right here. Yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of guitars in there, man. Hot blooded. 
hear the, I like listening to the uh, vocal tracks on some of these, uh, yeah. you know, vocal tracks in isolation because you can hear the uh, headphones. If you listen close, you can actually hear what Lou is hear, listening on his headphones. Hear it right there. Heard that little. That's crazy. And the same thing on these vocal tracks, you know, when you hear all those vocals, you know, that was the, you know, the late seventies, early eighties, you know, gang vocals, right. Uh, super popular technique again, to stack the, all the vocal tracks up. Those guys are singing in different pitches. It just thickens up, you know, how, you know, big and, and wide that those vocals sound. So pretty, pretty cool technique there. So, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things too, Dave, I thought was pretty cool was, you know, prepping for this is when you look at mix, kind of overall track record um, and you look at what his history was over, gosh, you know, almost five decades. Um, you know, I didn't fully appreciate um, how much, how much, um, you know, producing that he did outside of foreigner. And, you know, he's got some very notable uh, producing credits. One that I didn't know of uh, until just recently uh, looking at, you know, his, uh, his Wikipedia article, but I totally have forgotten that he produced 5150, you know, Van Halen's record back in 1986. So, you know, that's, gosh, a little less than 10 years into, into his career, into, into Mick's career, and he's producing Van Halen. Like, that's what nice. the heck? That is just so crazy to me. And then he did some uh, Bad Company, uh, and then he did uh, uh, Stormfront, Billy Joel Stormfront in 1989. Yeah. which I thought was what the heck, that's just so crazy. And then when you really look at, you know, mix, you know, capabilities, right. There's no doubt the guy's just an amazing musician and producer. I kind of, I want to get your thoughts on this too, Dave. I kind of, he might not be as good as, as this reference here, but I kind of look at him as almost like a, like a Luke, Lukather, you know, yeah. there's the same way. Like the, that guy played on every, Every cool record you heard for three decades, you know, Lukather played on. If he didn't write it, he played on it. Yeah. Rhythm, guitar, lead stuff and everything, you know, and, and Lukather produces too. It's really interesting to look at that era and see how many guitar players were kind of cross-pollinating under the radar for all, you know, for a couple of decades with all those different records. I wonder why they did that back then. I wonder why, you know. I mean, like, you know, like, if you take, for instance, like some of the Kiss stuff, the early Kiss stuff, you know, you know, Ace was known to party a little bit, and sometimes, he, sometimes he didn't show up. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he was there, but he wasn't there. So, yeah. um, they, you know, they had they brought ringers in. They brought people that could that could do it. Um, yeah, like on you know Jesse's Girl, that wasn't him playing it. That was uh, Neil Giraldo from. Pat Benatar's band. Pat Benatar, yeah. Yeah, so it's like... That guy's another monster. Yeah, it's like, so there's things that, you know, it doesn't work out, and, and it's better that, you know, a lot of that stuff's uncredited, you know, yeah. to this day, you know, a lot of that stuff that you'll never find out about, but right. some of the stuff we're only finding out about. Yeah. You, you can kind of think, you know, like, if you think back, some of those solos were a little clean for Ace, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it could be the same thing. Well, I mean, everybody knows... You know, he didn't play a single note on Creatures. Yeah. Um, to, you know, <laughs> rumor is he played very few notes on the Unmasked album. So as you kind of peel that back, you're like, uh, Kiss, Alive, Kiss Alive 2 is the same way it wasn't really alive. Correct. Yeah, that was uh, that was the Kulik, right? That was old Bob <laughs> Kulik was yeah. like, like the go to, uh, uh, you know, the the hated uh, hated way before uh, Tommy was hated. <laughs> but, I mean, the, you know, the foreigner, was the, they, they were he's just a he was just a freaking hit machine there for a while I and mean, he was just pumping them out so decades they, be, they become the go-to person and it's like you know yeah they end up right. playing, I, can, I can play that part let me play it yeah and i think that you know what's really interesting too is you know when we were growing up and listening to these songs you know like you said in the last episode you know we didn't have youtube man it wasn't until the mid 80s we got guitar for the practicing musician right and we would get some pseudo tabs which yeah. happened Half the time, you and I learned we're wrong. You know, wrong. Somebody taking a, a best guess right before they printed that magazine, right? Yeah, trying uh, to get it to press quick. Correct. And I remember, uh, you know, when you and I were first, you know, you know, learning guitar and playing guitar. Man, we couldn't 
we wouldn't be where we're at today without learning some of Mick's basic rock stuff. Like yeah. people don't realize it's not easy to blend in with a band and everybody get that pocket together and really lock in tight where everybody's playing, you know, together and you just get that nice, you know, thick, um, you know, aligned sound across the band. And these early rock songs were the foundation for what, you know, you and I prepared for in the eighties when music made a significant shift to way more technical. Obviously the yeah. red stuff came in and the click track obviously <laughs> gravitated to that stuff, which we've got yeah. rough guitar players. We're going to, we're going to talk about from that era, but well, you know, the click track was a, a big deal too, though, when it came in, it changed yeah. things as well. Yeah. And, and a lot of these, I've imported a lot of these older sessions into pro tools and, you know, try to find, you know, the, the, the actual, you know, beat, um, uh, you know, beats per minute on some of these songs. It just, it doesn't exist. Yep. You know, I would say that wasn't even a thing until way, way later. So, you know, you look at all these old songs, you know, and I, and I think that also plays to why those bands had to play them front to back together. Yeah. Um, cause, um, you know, even, you know, Van Halen one is, is that it, it's a little bit off of a half step down. Yeah, so it's a little sharp. I think this yeah. is, the foreigner is a half step too. I thought it was kind of interesting to find that that it's yeah like yeah. Uh, so a, a lot of bands that you know it's kind of gets ingrained in your psyche. You know why, why do you like a half step down? It's like because a lot of the music I listen to is half step down. Correct. Um, and I like the sound of it, and you know it helps on singers and stuff like that too when you play in bands. But um, yeah, yeah, it was um, so like you know I, I can imagine Van Halen just picking up his guitar and strumming it in tune and saying, okay, go. Yeah. And the band starts playing. It's like, well, is that early in tune? I don't, you know. Right. Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. The Doc and stuff did that as well. There was a lot of times, even on the same record and those guitars, they weren't a full half step sharp or flat. They were right in between. And mm -hmm. I always wondered like, all right, was that because they had an issue with transferring the tape yeah. you know, to the master or was that, too many beers the night before and i remember when i was a kid and and i was learning this stuff you know all i have was a, a record player and so it was like i was thinking well maybe it's my record player because i had my tuner my little tuner banana tuner i still got one of them but yeah. it, uh, i'd be in tune with that and then i'd go to play with the record and it would be like it didn't sound right it's like it was because you know i think it was my record was off you know yeah yeah the record player's not playing perfectly at the speed that it needs to be Correct. Yeah. And then, and then come to find later, it's just they, they tune different. They just tune different. Man, what was that? Uh, <clears throat> what was that device? I remember, God, dude, this would have been, you know, early 80s, 83, 84. You got a hold of some device that we could we could half the speed of the songs. It was a it, it was a um, wasn't the was cassette, that? mini cassette recorder. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it had those little, bitty a, those little cassette small cassette tapes. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and it, so, and it flipped it in half. And yeah, half so speed. basically what Dave would do for us, because we were all banging our heads trying to learn these faster <laughs> solos, yeah. right? It was impossible to learn these solos. Um, so he would he would record that into that mini recorder because you couldn't get the whole song a lot of times. So he'd just yeah. take that solo part, and then we'd go over to his house. You know, There'd be a bunch of us, and we'd be literally sitting there. Listening to it. Yeah, be listening to it, and Dave would be like, "All right, man, where the heck is this guy at?" So because it was it was half speed, you could actually, and you knew it was an octave too, it was an octave off. So it was an octave off. Yeah, yeah, it's always an octave. So we we could actually articulate those notes and be like, "Okay, now we got at least the basic framework of what scale he's using," and we could you know get in there and learn those songs. And that was you know that was and, and you know, it, a lot of that helped develop your ear too because it's like you can hear like certain things like like whether they're hitting an open g you can hear that yeah. string ring or yeah. they're hitting a power chord or something you can, correct you can discern between those things and their hand positioning you could determine yeah. you had to figure out well where is their positioning at depending on the sound of the notes versus yeah reading a tab or watching them on youtube oh that's what he's doing you know that kind yeah. of thing yeah but you had to use your your imagination and your ear to to figure these things out. out yeah the timber was different you could definitely yeah. hear the the open, you know, the open G versus a power chord or whatever, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, pretty crazy, man. It's, it's uh, a lot of fun. So cool. So uh, we'll wrap up for, for this episode. Uh, we appreciate everybody, you know, uh, we're getting a lot of awesome comments, uh, a lot of great questions and feedback. 
uh, a couple of things that I just want to announce. Um, Dave and I have been working really hard to you know, make these episodes interesting, to provide some deeper context into the players and some of the recordings. So this will be the format going forward to where every, every guitar player that we have will actually have these um, uh, isolated tracks where we can get a really good insights into, into the tones and uh, you know, just better understanding how, you know, how the songs are structured and, and how these guitar riffs are kind of you know, glued together in these mixes. Um, and that said, we would really appreciate uh, your support. We have a Patreon link that we'll, that we'll link down below that um, has our patch files. So we have an Axe Effects, effects patch and a headrush, headrush patch for Mick Jones's tone for Hot Blooded. Uh, and then we have these tracks in there to practice to. So you can download that on our Patreon and then you can basically mute the guitar track so you can play the rhythms or you can even try to you know, learn the leads and play the leads uh, without without that track being there. Just a fun little thing to do to you know, help learn the songs or relearn the songs like like I had to do. It's been a long time since I you know, uh, played Hot Blood. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was kind of fun to get back into it. So we'll link that down below. And then uh, we definitely appreciate your support and everything. So. Yep. Um, Dave, any last uh, any last comments on uh, Mr. Jones? No, just uh, you know, it helped me appreciate you know this this solid rhythm playing and, and even his lead playing, and then and then it's got my love for singing too. You know, it kind of helped that as well. But just the the melodies and his vocals are just awesome. They're still great. They still hold up. Um, just a you know, it's just an overall good experience. I'm I'm glad I got introduced into them. You know, it's like. Who knows? I'd still be playing disco or, or trying to do disco stuff or <laughs> or country or something. Yeah, like. country or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can country. thank uh, Tim Finfrock for that. So, Tim, if you're yeah. out there, hey. <laughs> yeah. Last I heard, he was in he was in Florida, but then he moved somewhere further north. So I don't I don't know. Gotta, gotta hook up with him. Yeah. Well, hopefully he'll uh, hear about this and uh, reach out to us. So. Yep. Cool, cool. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, you know logging in and uh, watching another episode with us. We appreciate it. We will see you next time. Another awesome guitar player and some more fun listening to the uh, isolated tracks. So we'll see you next time. Thank you. Come on, baby. Do you do more than do?